Hey, what's up guys? Today I'll show you a horror film, Fallen. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with a man's voice over, sharing his story of when he almost died. Then a man is shown crawling onto the snow, like he is trying to get away from something or someone. He is desperately trying his best, despite his vision going in circles. Moments later, his body falls to the ground. The scene then switches to a detective with the Philadelphia Police Force, visiting the city's notorious serial killer. A police officer calls the detective to the serial killer's cell, who is in high spirits, despite being on death row. The serial killer informs the detective that there will be a documentary about him. The detective and the serial killer face each other, and the serial killer aggressively puts his hand in between the bars. The detective shakes his hand for a second, and the serial killer starts to mumble something in an unknown language, so the detective quickly frees himself from the grip. The detective decides to leave, but he is worded out when the serial killer gives him a riddle before leaving the cell. Following that, the serial killer taunts the onlookers of his execution and later on sings, Time is on my side, written by the Rolling Stones. He sings like a madman and smokes come out from the chamber. Not long after, the serial killer meets his death. Subsequently, the detective meets his partner in the field and another colleague at a bar. While drunk, the colleague picks on the detective and insults his profession. But the detective handles it well and calmly defends himself and the other cops. At the same time that night, a weird thing happens at one of the busy streets of Philadelphia. A man whistling the time is on my side bumps into another person who then looks like he has been possessed. Then it passes from person to person through touch, and the passing of the possession ends in a man nicknamed the Bedevile Guy. He spends his afternoon like a regular man, despite killing an innocent man. Following that, the Bedevile Guy observes the detective from afar as the detective gets to work. The detective receives a tip for a possible murder from a tipster at the precinct. Later that day, the detective, together with his partner and some examiners, goes to the address to investigate. It turns out it is the apartment of the Bedevile guy's victim. While analyzing the crime scene, they find puncture wounds and a number 18 on the dead body, with a neat dining table and letters on the wall, akin to the serial killer's riddle. The detective looks at it, astonished by the weird coincidence. The detective reports his assumption to the lieutenant, and he says that the serial killer might have an accomplice. After that, the detective and his partner discuss the case. Unexpectedly, their colleague gives them a clue about the riddle. The detective gets into work right away and finds out about a decorated detective in 1965 who died in a gun accident. The next day, the detective informs the lieutenant about his investigation. Still, the lieutenant refuses to help and advises him to keep whatever he finds out to himself. Following that, while they watch the serial killer's documentary, the detective's partner points out the unknown language that the serial killer is speaking, and he says it is significant. Later that day, the detective tracks down the decorated detective's daughter, short named The Lady, and the detective informs her about his investigation. The detective mentions the serial killer, and the lady brings up the singing and grabbing incident before the execution. However confused, the detective dismisses it. The lady then shares that her father killed himself in their family cabin in the mountains, after being accused of a series of murders identical to the detective's current case. She refuses to believe that her father is a murderer, but somehow, the lady objects to share why she thinks so. That evening, the detective coincidentally encounters the bedevile guy while walking on the streets. Following that, the bedevile guy bumps into a stout man on the train, passing the possession to him. Later that night, the detective receives two prank calls from someone, while he is at his house with his brother and nephew. Meanwhile, the bedevile guy is confused, because he does not remember what happened to him. Then, the stout man barges into his home and repeatedly stabs him with a syringe. After killing him, the stout man calls the detective a couple of times, still not making a sound and leaves. Following that, the detective and his partner reach out for a linguist to decipher the serial killer's words. He informs them that the language is an antique, a biblical tongue called Syrian Aramaic, a language that regular people have not spoken for a long time. The linguist then requests a copy of the documentary to translate. After that, another tip from the tipster causes the police force to investigate another death. It is the apartment and the body of the Bedevov guy. Like the first case, the body has the number 2 written on his chest. There is also a neat dining table, writings on the wall, and a syringe with poison. The following day, the detective's partner informs him of the connection of the Bedevov guy in their case. 
After that, he visits the cabin in the mountains, which the lady talks about. Despite being abandoned, the detective proceeds to search the cot, reaching the basement. There he finds various unsettling books about demonic possession hidden under the woods, and the word Azazel written on a wall. Subsequently, he goes to the lady, asks about the writing, and a book that talks about demons who can move by touch. She then strongly advises him to drop the case for the sake of his life and his loved ones, leaving the detective more intrigued. Back at the precinct, the lieutenant informs the detective that before the death of the two guys, their last phone calls were at his house. The lieutenant clarifies that he does not suspect the detective of anything and is just following his superior's orders. After that, his partner gives him the translation of the Syrian Aramaic from the linguist, which contains some disturbing threats. The detective continues his investigation by watching the tape and reading the Bible. At the same time, when in the precinct, the detective witnesses what he read about demons moving by touch from his colleagues to ordinary people while singing Time is on my side, and they have no recollection of what just happened when they bump into another person. When the detective talks in Syrian, he catches an elderly couple's attention who are currently possessed, proving that he is facing the demon Azazel, who transfers through touch from one human to another. Azazel threatens him to be careful about what he discovered at the cabin. Later that day, the detective meets the lady outside a sanctuary to talk about his encounter with Azazel. Freaked out, he demands her to answer why the serial killer and Azazel threatened him. She then explains that Azazel is one of the fallen angels and was punished by being deprived of angel form and only able to survive in the bodies of mortal humans. She further explains why the serial killer spoke in an almost forgotten language during their conversation and why he grabbed his hand, because Azazel wanted to possess him. However, Azazel failed to dominate him that time, so he will find some other way. The lady believes that few people are destined to defeat the fallen angels, and the detective is one of them. Because of the information she shared, the detective realizes that she has been preparing to conquer evil. The lady then bids goodbye and leaves. However, they are unaware that Azazel is watching them. Subsequently, Azazel follows the lady on the busy streets, who is now aware of his presence. He then corners the terrified lady and tries to bewitch her, but the human bumps into another person, freeing her. The lady quickly runs to escape, while Azazel immediately transfers himself into the people's bodies, running after her. Luckily, the petrified lady escapes the sadistic Azazel before he possesses her. Following that, the lady and the detective meet in a church, where she regretfully shares that she should not have run away from Azazel, because she spent years preparing to defeat demons like him. The detective then decides not to see her anymore because of the danger. Afterward, the detective gets back at the precinct, where the lieutenant raises the superior's suspicion again because they found the detective's prints in one of the crime scenes. Persistent that he is innocent, the detective assumes he is being framed up, just like what happened to the decorated detective. However, the lieutenant refuses to hear decide and advises him to take the day off and spend his day with family. His nephew and playmate greet the detective as he comes home that afternoon. While inside, he notices a huge black eye on his brother's face, so his brother had no choice but to confess that his son had hit him. His brother defends his son and says it was only an accident, but the detective realizes that Azazel possessed his nephew and harmed his family. He quickly gets his nephew back to his usual self and is confused by his uncle. The detective goes out and chases his nephew's playmate out in the street, while the playmate is possessed by Azazel. The kid bumps into a middle-aged man, who gets a gun from a car and fires it towards the detective. The man then taunts the detective by refusing to put the gun down, forcing him to shoot in front of bystanders. Azazel leaves the body and transfers into one of the bystanders and confidently confronts the detective that once his host is dead, he will transfer as a spirit and no man can resist him after that. Fed up, the detective asks why not kill him, but Azazel teases him that he is still having fun and leaves. That evening, the onlookers and investigators examine the crime scene, getting a statement from witnesses. Then the lieutenant confronts the detective and says that the detective's fingerprints are found in one of the murder scenes and the recent killing. Therefore, the detective has become the suspect of all three murders. The detective defends himself and his partner backs him up. They see a three-letter word on the dead man's chest, saying a po, and the detective thinks it is a message, but the lieutenant refuses to listen. At the precinct, the detective asks his partner a series of moral questions about a person's true purpose in life. His partner replies that it differs from person to person, and when the moment comes that a person realizes their cause in life, they will know what to do next. After a long and exhausting day, the detective comes home to his brother and nephew. 
He calls the lady and asks for clarifications about Azazel. According to one of her father's books, humans can travel for 500 air miles with just one breath, and after that, they will die if they can't find any host. The following day, the detective notices something in the house, another three-letter word on the mirror, C-A-L. He realizes that Azazel was in their home last night, so he checks his nephew, who has the letter Y on his chest. The detective then goes to his brother, who has been dead for hours because of poison, looking asleep with a three-letter word P-S-E on his chest. The detective silently mourns his death when he sees the news about the recent shooting. Azazel gives a false statement to the media in a human body, claiming that the detective was the one who shot his gun first. His partner calls him to inform him that one of their colleagues will come to the house and take him to the precinct to talk about the case. The detective quickly bags a few belongings and flees with his nephew, while Azazel smirks at him as he runs. After running away from the Philadelphia police, the detective then confesses to his nephew that his father is not asleep but dead. The kid handles the news unexpectedly well for his age, with his uncle reassuring him that his father will definitely go to heaven. Following that, having nowhere else to go, they go to the lady's place. There, the detective spends hours studying Azazel's clue of the Bible, the Revelation or Apocalypse 18.2. The lady then informs him that when Azazel is in a spirit, he is much stronger because he is fighting for his life. Afterward, the detective bids goodbye to the two and leaves with a heavy heart yet ready to face Azazel. On his way to the cabin, the detective calls his partner to have a little talk, aware that the police are listening. He patiently waits for hours for Azazel to arrive, but his partner and lieutenant appear instead. The lieutenant fiercely enforces the arrest of the detective, but his partner is weak-willed because of the years they spent together as partners. The detective puts his gun down and just seconds later, his partner shoots the lieutenant right on the head, killing him. Shocked, the detective realizes that Azazel has possessed his partner, so he quickly hides inside. Azazel sings the song, taunting him, while the detective hides in the cabin. Azazel prepares to shoot the current host's body to allow him to possess the detective, but the detective comes out and wrestles for the gun. As they brawl, sudden gunshot echoes in the place, revealing his partner with a gunshot wound. However, Azazel continues to taunt the detective, thinking he will win the fast and furious fight. However, the detective then reveals all is according to his plan to defeat evil. He smokes a cigarette and explains the cigarette is laced with the same poison Azazel used to kill the innocent, particularly his brother. The detective then taunts Azazel, who realizes that with the detective dying, he will be stranded in the wilderness without a host. The detective then fires his gun, aimed at his partner's head, killing him and attempting to leave the devil with no human host. As expected, Azazel transfers to the detective's body and desperately tries to save himself, but ends up failing as the body succumbs to the deadly poison. However, the film ends with Azazel's mockery voiceover, reminding the audience that he almost died in the beginning. At the same time, a cat comes out from beneath the cabin, then heads back to civilization. Apparently, the cat, able to be used as the host as human body, is possessed by Azazel, who is ready to spread evil in the world again. This is Daniel's CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.